I'm going to pivot just a little bit to some more general slides with Drs. Albala and Kaufman, and then we'll sort of try to reconvene at the end, allow Dr. Kapoor to make some final comments, integrate what we've talked about into his final comments, and then take questions from the audience. So this is really a stab in the dark. We have no idea what the Biden administration is really planning to do. We've gotten very little insight into their agenda or priorities at this point. From a background vantage point, it's important to note that LUGPA focuses on the committees of jurisdiction. So in Senate, that's finance. In House, that's ways and means in EC. The, um, and particularly the health subcommittees in both of those areas. The um, Republicans have uh, indicated their membership on both sides of Congress. So these will be the legislators with whom we lobby, whom we interact, whom our consultants speak to over the next uh, legislative session. But it's important to note that LUGPA, HP, and PA spend almost as much, if not more, time working on the regulatory side with CMS and HHS. And on that side, we work both with political appointees as well as with career officials. And that's significant because the rules, which are created and pay us by most of our biggest payers, what is the biggest payer for most of us, which is CMS, are created in these regulatory agencies. And then they're enacted by statute by our legislators. So Dr. Kaufman, I think, wanted to remark on the slide. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Mar wanted me to comment on this, and I think it's, it's a pretty dramatic slide. You can see that it goes back to, I think, 1992, and you can see that the, that the conversion factor um, really is uh, pretty flat, if it's not a little bit down. But obviously, we know that uh, inflation is way up. And so if we were truly getting what we should be getting, we should be at the top of that uh, light blue line, not uh, down where we are. And of course, we've, we've allowed this to happen to us, unfortunately, because we've been too busy taking care of patients for the most part. And this slide also shows, which I can't read from here, but it does tell you that we're really down about uh, 20 percent, or 40 percent, 40 on average on our reimbursement over the years. And that's where we are compared to 20 years ago. So we can see that's really pretty depressing if you're trying to uh, you know, maintain a practice, an office. Even if you're employed by a university as I am, you still have your budget, you still have your overhead, and what's coming in the till is not going to keep up with your overhead. So we have a substantial problem here. So I think it's worth highlighting that that conversion factor slide, uh, which I can't go back to, um, shows a real dollar reduction from 20 years ago. So that's not adjusted. Um, but at least we have the best health care and the best health in the entire world. Oh, wait. <laughs> we don't. Um, perhaps that's because we just have too many doctors, right? So per capita, we must have the most, except compared to our G7 colleagues, we don't. So the two curves which are flat there are France and the U.S., and France is one and a half times the number of providers per capita. What we do have is a lot more specialists. So. That has traditionally been perceived as a weakness in our system, but I really think that, uh, not pivoting, but um, playing on what Dr. Kapoor was talking about, that this is really an opportunity. The value-based initiatives and the meaningful reform that's been talked about for a decade or more has all really sprung from primary care-based initiatives that have not been effective in creating any real meaningful systemic reform. So again, using what we've got, which is us and our colleagues and our peers in specialties, that's what we have in America. We can be the driver of meaningful, significant systemic change, rather than an afterthought or just sort of uh, you know, the, the previous iteration, which was that we're always a negative impact on costs. So before we get back into the reform efforts, SGR, those sorts of things. Let's talk quickly about the omnibus. Everyone was very focused on the conversion factor. So we were looking at about a 10% pay cut between the conversion factor 4.4% and PAYGO. PAYGO got waived. The conversion factor, as everyone knows, the cut was dropped by 2.5%. So we ended up with about a 1.9% pay cut. That's a pay cut in the face of inflation. So it's, it's more significant, but that's where we landed. Alternative payment reform was due to lapse in 2023 and was extended. Um, the bonuses dropped from the 5% threshold to a 3.5% threshold, 
And then uh, it's important to note that those will essentially be eliminated in 2024 and beyond. So that 5% is now 3.5% and will be essentially nothing thereafter. Telehealth was extended, the waivers for telehealth were extended through 24. The clinical lab fee schedule, which had been set to reduce this year, that was extended or delayed. The sequester was extended through 2032 to help pay for some of this. And then really significantly, I think, is that you know, the IRA has a lot of stuff that requires a lot of data analysis, and we don't know what the Part D, Part B reform will look like, but CBO is beginning their data collection and was authorized to and uh, given money to do so in the omnibus. Dr. Holton, some people in the audience may not know what the sequester is. Uh, could you just maybe just talk for a second about that 2%? Right. So um, hopefully most of you do know that essentially whatever you get paid, the government for um, budget neutrality holds back 2%. So the sequester is based on a balanced budget and the, the almost the overwhelming portion of that is the healthcare and Medicare spending. And that's based on automatically they reduce everything that they pay us by 2%. And they did give us a break during COVID on that and then they phased it back in. And that has been phased back in. I think it's almost entirely phased yes. back in as of January, yeah. Um, so, Dr. Kaufman, you talked about the 30 to 40 percent reduction in many of the most common codes that we do, but in the end for this year, you know, we ended up with about that 1.9 percent cut. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, those are the codes uh, performed by urologists, and there's been a lot of uh, angst amongst everyone who does prostate cancer surgery that, gee, why did, why did radical prostatectomy get such a huge cut? And, you know, it really goes back to what Mara was saying in the beginning that, you know, when they came out with the current reimbursement uh, strata back in, in uh, 1992, and they created this concept called the RUC, which is Relative Value-Based Resource uh, Schema, um, it was in really to encourage primary care. And primary care at the expense of specialists, as Mara said. And so there's a new code this year. Uh, we finally had enough utilization for uh, robotically assisted laparoscopic simple prostatectomy, which is great. We've been doing this unlisted code, now we have a code. That's the good news. The bad news is that any codes in the same code set, like radical prostatectomy that's laparoscopic, have to get resurveyed. That's how the rock works, that's how the value comes around. So, unfortunately, when the surveys went out, uh, the membership who do radical prostatectomies, you know, despite a lot of guidance and encouragement by people like myself to, you know, not be macho and to remember your typical case, not your best case, the pre-op time, the setup time, the time afterwards, the time submitted were obviously very short. And so the value was decreased. So what you have is what you see, and basically because people don't pay attention to the surveys that they get, and in the end, that, that's what happens. So I would, you know, remind everyone, obviously this is over and done, but there will be other surveys or other code sets you know, something's going to change. Um, so for those, those of you who don't get the message, he's imploring you to be, at the very least, accurate, if not overestimate, the burden well, on you of doing procedures. Because by being hot shots, we end up not getting paid for what we do. It's pretty remarkable that our prostatectomists are getting, I mean, really, I think a PCR probably pays me more than sending a doctor over to the hospital to take out a prostate. Not much more than a vasectomy. So think about that. So, and then, you know, again, just to highlight, this 2% pay cut across the board with some variation all over the place, because again, it's an average, is against the background of an ongoing public health emergency, unprecedented staff shortages, and unprecedented wage inflation for almost all of us. So it's really not a terribly pretty picture, and, and most of us are living that in our individual milieus, whatever kind of practice we're in. And Dr. Holden, uh, Dr. Kapoor is in my ear. He wanted to just make sure that um, we understood that that 2% sequester is of the 80% part that Medicare pays and that it also includes your Part B drugs. So all your LHRH, all your other drugs, the very high-end drugs, 2% is a significant, it's a significant number. And you know, we fight every day just to get a tenth of a percent. And you know, when we get cut 2%, that's huge. And that's gonna continue on with the sequester. Through 2032. To, through 2032. Um, and then, of course, the other factor is that MedMal, which had dropped significantly during COVID, there was a, a lot of readjustment in the gypsy related to MedMal that was seen during COVID. 
And this resulted in very discordant um, burdens to practices related to these adjustments subsequent to that. So people who are in high med mal cost areas and high litigation areas, e.g., for example, Queens and many of the New York suburbs, saw proportionately to some of these other um, counties and lo locales really significant cost cuts. So again, whenever you look at these uh, fee schedules, recognize that there are adjustments based on your geography. So Dr. Obala, maybe you can talk about how we're dealing with it. So I think what's important here in the next couple of slides is, is how can we fight back and what is the best strategy? I think um, whether you're in academic medicine, you're employed by a hospital or in a private group, um, there are ways that you can sort of mitigate these cost reductions and try to, you know, add to the bottom line. You know, many practices are starting to use advanced practice providers and using them in a, in a very resourceful way and um, imaging, you've seen MRI uh, technology is now being brought to the providers. Um, radiation services obviously have been around for quite some time. Um, pathology, we're seeing an upswing in ambulatory surgery centers and, and consolidation of, of different practices. So there are ways I think that practices can look at different ways to try to improve things. Next slide. But I think that this is really the, the, the take home message for me. You know, 3% of med the Medicare budget is for urology. So we are not big fish in the pond. There is a way that we can become big fish. And, you know, we have very active lobbying. The AUA and LUGPA have worked together on many issues. You know, what are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to protect our practices. Um, and I think we need to, to work together hand in hand and with one voice. And, and it really does matter. To me, that's the most powerful thing that we can do. You know, LUGPA has a, uh, a, an advocacy program that's going to be coming up in, in the spring. The AUA does. Um, and the bottom line is the, the message is the same. We're delivering the same message to the legislators. You know, it's interesting. I, I worked in the White House for a year. Um, when, I was, when I was at Loyola, I took a year off from medicine and was a White House fellow. And when you actually get in to see how all these decisions are made, um, you know, these people understand the issues, but they, they have to have it explained to them. And we have not done a great job with that. And, and I would tell you that the advocacy portion of what the AUA does and what LUGPA does is really an important message for whether you're in academic medicine or not. I mean, it's interesting, you know, the, the AUA Advocacy Summit, not many uh, academic physicians went to that. And now that's very popular among academic physicians. The LUGPA advocacy uh, program that's going to be in March is going to be equally as important. Um, but you got to get boots on the ground. And to me, that's the take home message. We have to be united. You know, we're much better as a, as a group than individual going up to Congress and trying to lobby one way or another. So before I turn it over to Dr. Kapoor in the audience, I wanted to just go through what I thought some of those general initiatives that we've decided um, at our LUGPA board as well as in tandem with our uh, colleagues at AUA and AACU are primary goals. So one is clearly the reform of MIPS-MACRA. This is a <laughs> failed program. Everyone accepts that this is a failed program. It's a recapitulation of the SGR. It's a disaster. It's got the attendant uncertainty, um, the total illogic. It, it's just nonsensical. And this is a real opportunity. LUGPA wrote a very powerful letter um, uh, in tandem with some other groups in the I guess spring of last year, which really did outline how, again, specialists and those you know within our, our community can offer some, some meaningful and significant options to this MIPS macro program. Site initial payment reform has always been a predicate, and it will continue to be a predicate of any meaningful value-based initiative, because fundamentally you cannot, within a system which is fair, pay massively different amounts or totally unjustified differences in amounts based on site of service for equivalent care. 340B, um, I think I'm going to pass on, but it's created fairly large slush funds for hospitals. It was, it is currently, uh, it was uh, rescinded and then reiterated and we're sort of dealing with the fallout of that. I'll let Kapoor talk about that if he wants to at length, but that's kind of a mess. P3 
PBM reform really does go to this drug reform initiative. So part, the IRA is not going away. No one knows what the IRA is going to look like. Part B and Part D got folded together, which is in fact a good thing from our vantage point. But um, it's really difficult to know what drugs will be impacted preemptively because of the retrospective way that they look at it and the promulgation of the initial drugs in 2026. Attendant or alongside that is PBM reform. There is definitely, as Kapoor talked about, the recognition that the inflationary impact of drug costs has a huge amount to do with why patients are experiencing financial toxicity. So PBM reform having to do with how insurance companies, again, I think uh, Dr. Kapoor's did slides did a really nice job of demonstrating how that has to do with the relationship between the insurance companies offsetting payment burden to the patients, and, and that's where PBM reform wraps in. Price transparency, and then of course, AKS Stark reform. We cannot collaborate meaningfully across practice types, across um, specialties, if we cannot collaborate both clinically and financially. So Stark and AKS currently make that very, very gray and muddled. So there was an initiative in the Trump administration which essentially did allow for these kinds of initiatives outside of traditional ACO models, but it's, it's not really clear how that's going to play out. So that's, I think, pretty much all I have to say. I don't know if anybody else does. Dr. Kapoor, did you want to make some final comments? Uh, <clears throat> no, I think that that was a, uh, a really thorough and uh, extremely, uh, uh, hopefully for the audience, extremely informative uh, conversation around uh, <clears throat> things that occupy from a health policy and political affairs uh, perspective, a great deal of uh, our time as a um, as an organization. But I would very much like to get the uh, uh, feedback from the balance of the panel as well as um, uh, from uh, the audience as far as how meaningful this is or what their general take on um, on the circumstances are, you know, um, and we we really are faced at a crossroads, and that crossroads is that the House of Medicine, urology certainly, but again, we're 2.3 percent of the spend, but the House of Medicine writ large will band together and demand that we have meaningful payment reform, or or we're just going to continue to be marginalized, not just as a specialty but as a profession. So thank you, Scott, and thank you, Mara, uh, you. as well as uh, Ron and Dave. Always a pleasure uh, to interact with uh, with such esteemed colleagues. So I'll turn it yeah. back to you, Scott. Okay, great. Uh, I, I think uh, we need to also make one comment here. Mara, in her presentation, talked about committees of jurisdiction, how important it is to have uh, leader, leaders in those roles that we can have relationships with. and. We're fortunate now that there's actually two urologists in Congress. How many of you knew that there were two urologists in Congress? Show of hands. So maybe about a quarter of the room knew that. And so we've got Dr. Greg Murphy and Dr. Neil Dunn. And I just want to ask the panel and maybe Dr. Kapoor just real quick before we open this up to the audience, how important is it to us to have two urologists in Congress, especially now both on committees of jurisdiction? Uh, you know, I'm certainly happy to uh, uh, address that. It's incredibly important. It's incredibly important. You know, Neil doesn't practice anymore, but uh, uh, as you know, Neil Dunn actually happened to be a partner of Scott's in his um, in his practice. Uh, and uh, Greg Murphy from uh, North Carolina actually still practices. And um, I will tell you, I happen to know both of them uh, through our interactions. Uh, uh, on policy very, very well. And both of them have expressed an incredible degree of frustration as to how limited the degree of support they experience from people within their own specialty. I can assure you, there was a few years ago where there was a, um, uh, 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 a uh, radiation oncologist in um, uh, from the South, I think he was either from Alabama, I think he was from Alabama or Mississippi. Uh, uh, no, Georgia, he was from Georgia, that's correct. And uh, the amount of political contributions that that Radon got from anti-Stark forces was greater than the cumulative contribution for urology to all of Congress. I mean, that's remarkable, right? And so, uh, uh, it, it, 
it, it's it's incredibly important. And not only that, we have a um, uh, uh, one of the the, the leaders. Uh, we have a number of senators, and one of our greatest champions is Senator Bill Cassidy. We have other senators that are uh, physicians. You know, the 17 physicians that are, uh, or 19 physicians that are in Congress, they're inclined to be very receptive to what we have to say, and it's very, and a lot of them are, are fairly senior, and it's incumbent upon us to support them. So, yeah. sorry, that was a little bit longer, but that's a really important point, Scott. Well, I also want to be clear to the audience that LUGPA supports all physician and urology friendly candidates. We're not partisan. We support Democrats, Republicans, House, Senate. We, we, we support fit individuals that support us. And uh, so I think that's really important for everybody to understand that uh, actually within the last couple of years, it's pretty close to 50-50. Maybe it's still a little bit of a shift more toward Republicans and Democrats just because of the way it works out. But it's, uh, it's, it's pretty close now to 50-50. To um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Uh, I'm sure we've stimulated some questions, and don't be shy. Any question's a good question. And uh, we've got about 15 minutes where we can uh, wrap things up and, and get some, let's make this interactive, hear what you have to say. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Stone. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent talk. Tomorrow I wanted to share a little anecdote, which I think is, could be very important for today. Back in 1990, when I started brachytherapy, we were getting, for urologists, adequate reimbursement and Medicare, this predates CMS, decided in their wisdom to cut at 90% without any justification. So I worked with Logan Holtgrew, many of the older folks may remember him, and we put together a movie of a procedure. So we chose a procedure, one of my procedures that was more complicated. It was like an hour and a half instead of 45 minutes, and we gave that to Medicare, and they reversed their decision. So the point here is, with your RLAP story is, it's really important for ourselves, our, pra our specialty, to advocate that the work we do is not easy, it's complicated in many of its aspects. And I really think more people advocating that can help us re reverse some of these decreases. I would, I mean, I think that that both um, from the vantage point of speaking to legislators, speaking to um, CMS, but honestly, also speaking to the community, because there has been sort of this pervasive, there's this tendency for people really to trivialize their training and how difficult all of the things that we've sort of, all the skills we've acquired over the years. And fundamentally, to Kaufman's point, then it's devalued. They value it as much as we indicate the value is. So I think that's really profound. Yeah, and Neil, I think Scott, it goes um, back uh, to... Can I just ask a favor? Uh, since I can't see, if the audience members could introduce themselves and where they're from, it, it would be great for me. Because I, uh, obviously, you know, I, I don't, I recognize, no, I know the people, but I don't necessarily you, know all You, you look like you're flying a helicopter there, Deke, so we're not really <laughs> sure where you are. <laughs> I, uh, you know, just at Neil's point, and I, w I will put in a... <laughs> can't beat that comment. Um, um, you know, that's where the advocacy part is important. And, and you know, this, this group has traditionally been academic physicians that have been involved in research. And, and I think that that voice, at least in Congress, has been, you know, not as, not as loud as some of the private, private groups. And, and I would encourage, you know, whether you're employed by a hospital or, or in the academics, um, you know, you need to get on into those offices and, and meet with these people to have them understand the issues. And that, the idea of a movie is, is, a, is a great example of how trying to make someone aware of what we do, you know, changes, make, can make change. And I would discourage movies, generally. <laughs> okay, uh, the next question is from Dr. David Crawford. Oh, you blew my joke. <laughs> um, I was going to say, uh, why don't I, I forgot my name, Joe Biden. Um, <laughs> anyway, Deke, uh, that, your presentation um, is an eye-awakening thing that I think a lot of people need to listen to that aren't. Uh, it, it's unfortunate that a lot of my academic colleagues aren't here for this presentation. Uh, there's some, you know, there's some firewall that exists between what Lugbud's doing and academics, and you just said it about uh, the, what was driving a lot of stuff. We need to come together. And uh, so I, that, that's a great message. My, my, another, the, the question I was going to ask, or a thing for discussion, Deke, uh, is relative to the amount of money spent. 
uh, on different cancers, and breast cancer is number one, and you showed that. And if you add the GU cancers together, it looks like they equal number one. So I'm not sure we should feel really, really bad about that. Breast cancer has been done an, an unbelievable job of lobbying and progress and things like that and markers. But you know, what can what can we do to, to put a positive spin on what we're doing and get the most for our buck, I guess? Well, I think, uh, and thank you for the kind uh, uh, comments, uh, David. And if there's a way to get the message out, certainly your uh, these meetings are really important for that. And if there's any further ways to get the message out more broadly, I'm happy to talk to you about that uh, uh, subsequently. I know uh, we uh, at one of the other meetings we did uh, some other, but it was eye-opening for me and really disturbing. The point of the of the 22 percent is not to make any is not to suggest that it's inappropriate or that that anybody should feel bad. But the reason why it gets attention is remember that we're 2.3 percent of the global spend. So if we're 2.3 percent of the global spend, but 22 percent of the oncology spend, that is uh, uh, that gets people's. Uh, 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 attention, particularly when we start talking about expensive drugs and expensive testing, you know, such as germline testing, such as uh, uh, the uh, uh, all the antiandrogen therapy, which are all really, really important. But what we need to do when we're talking about survival is we need to actually show that uh, that is economically meaningful. So let me give you a for example. Uh, the U uh, and uh, this is the uh, when we talk about the USPSTF. Now, I was one of the most vociferous um, uh, critics of the USPSTF, and in fact, my rhetoric was such that I got you know largely banned from um, uh, from talking about it uh, uh, because I was uh, aghast at the uh, policy. And if you go back to the writings, Lugpa was very very strong in that this would have an adverse effect on. Um, uh, on patient care. And of course, what we've seen um, uh, with the most uh, substantial article last year that was in JAMA that, uh, uh, that showed that, that with each change in USPSTF, the increase of uh, patients with metastatic disease at presentation um, was, uh, was dramatically greater. So for a legislator, the, uh, uh, who's interested in, in the, or for the legislative bean counters, caring for those patients is profoundly more expensive than than treating patients with early stage disease and so we what we need to do is also think about our messaging david we need to not just talk about uh what we're accomplishing but by treating the patients early and treating them appropriately that you're substantially extending their quality adjusted life years and the cost for quality is actually much much more reasonable than with other cancers so again Long-winded, but um, but the point's well taken. Great point. And uh, before we go to the next question, Dr. Kaufman wanted to add a comment. Just to augment that a little bit uh, on the financial toxicity. Um, there's actually an interesting article in the White Journal, I think it was last month, or by uh, Penson's group, you know, looking at the financial toxicity of these drugs, you know, the uh, high-powered anti-androgens, and really kind of calling the House of Urology as like a wake-up call that when we prescribe these for patients, we need to also talk to them about the financial impact on, on them and on their lifestyle um, so that they're not just sort of left out there to, um, you know, deal with it. And actually, there's an interesting commentary at the end. I guess there's a new area of, of research called the interventional pharmacoeconomics, which is actually doing studies to look at, um, you know, sort of treatment de-escalation without changing outcomes, looking at dose, duration, frequency, generics, things like that. Um, there's small data that low-dose abiraterone is just as effective as standard dose. Uh, there's some also early evidence that low-dose enzalutamide may also be. So I think we need to be kind of leading the charge as urologists so our patients can navigate through this you know, storm that's hitting them, not only medically, but psychologically. Okay, we've got uh, two questions left. I'm told we just have a few minutes, so I want to Quick questions and quick answers, Dr. Keen. Just a quick statement. I'm an academic urologist. I'm head of a program. And I can reassure you that every month we go through this with a fine tooth comb. Academics is just as concerned as Lugby is about this situation. And I hate the fact that we distinguish each other. We're all urologists. We're all in this together. 
and we really do need to come together and we need to be able to speak as one because at least 70% of the people that we graduate end up in private practice. That's if you take a look at the number of people who go into academics. I'm delighted if I get one a year, sometimes two a year, but we have fellows and academic urology is, should be and we certainly are just as committed as the Lugba groups are. Just wanted to let you know that. Great. Respectfully, respectfully, I appreciate the commitment and I appreciate the conversation. When you look at uh, uh, where the source of funding is for PACs, you know, every political contribution by every human being in the United States is tracked, it's law. And believe me when I tell you, I have the NPI numbers for every single urologist in the country, and I can tell you to the dollar what everybody contributes. And the fraction of political contributions that occurs from hospital-based and academic medicines is a fraction of, uh, uh, of the total. And, um, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, the uh, LUGPA contributes um, more than a million dollars per election cycle. And, and so engagement and conversation is very important. But political action doesn't occur without, um, uh, without money because money is what drives the political process. That doesn't mean you're buying a boat, but what that does is that gets you face time. And I will make one other point, Ron, as far as um, uh, uh, the impact on academics. Most, and you're right, we are all in the same boat and we all are urologists and I really appreciate that and I applaud that sentiment. But if you take a look at uh, the impact on people that are doing these procedures on robotics, the, the, the cut in reimbursement is associated with a cut in work, it's, it's work RVUs that are being cut by 16.2%, uh, by okay? So if you are getting paid a bonus based on work RVUs that you're generating in an academic center, all right, and you're getting a, uh, and let's say you do 20 robotic cases um, um, uh, uh, a month at a cut, uh, um, a GPCI adjusted cut of six work RVUs uh, per case, that's 120 work RVUs a month multiplied uh, by 12, you know, so that's north of 2,000 work RVUs that you're going to be losing um, uh, on this. And if you have to hit a 7,500 work RVU total, it's going to be impossible to overcome that. So the economic effect of these things are actually devastating to everybody, regardless of your compensation model. All right, we have one last Sorry, question. Sorry, Scott, that wasn't, that wasn't short. But, no, uh, no, 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 it wasn't short. But, <laughs> but I, I didn't really expect it to be. Uh, so the very, very, the very, very last question, comment, and then we've got to, we've got to run to this. We've been doing an abstract. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Scott Ahrens. I'm a retired urologist. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. I'm, a, I'm retired and you're not. Nya, 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 nya. <laughs> But I appreciate everything you guys are doing. I mean, it's wonderful to hear you. But I was a solo private practitioner, practitioner for about 35 years. And I think that a lot of what has, the, the panel has said has, address, has failed to address the two elephants that are in the room. Number one ele elephant was partially addressed by our initial speaker who talked about how the urologist said, oh, you gotta, get, you gotta get this MRI in the hospital and not outside the hospital. And it jacked the cost up astronomically. Well, as a practicing urologist in private practice and my other friends who were practicing urologists in, in the town that I practiced in, well, that's what we did. We sent all our stuff to outpatient radiology groups and saved the patients a mint. Well, Surgeons were doing that too, and we set up uh, surgery centers to try and deal with that. Well, the hospital decided they were going to try and get rid of every private practitioner in town. And I would say in the seven years before I retired, not a single new private practitioner came into town. All that they had were physicians hired by the hospital. And the hospital could then control where they send all the referrals. 
and they did everything calculated with the scheduling and everything else so that you had the entire surgery department that was there when I was there all quit and went to other hospitals because it was so horrible for physicians in private practice to live in that environment. And the second elephant that hasn't been addressed, because most of the young patients, I'm sorry, are not going into private practice. They're going into work for a hospital because they can't get into the networks for, to get reimbursed by the insurance companies. I mean, when I got out of medical school and out of residency, I could just hang up my shingle and see patients. You can't do that anymore because you have to be in all these stupid networks. And the only way they can get into the networks if there is, is if they're a salaried employee of either a large group or, or they're salaried by a hospital. They can't do that anymore. And so, which brings up the second big money grabber, and that's Epic. Epic, well, Epic is one of the reasons why I quit. <laughs> now, Epic is nothing but one big collection apparatus. The woman who started Epic was one of the biggest contributors to Barack Obama's campaign. And now almost all the hospitals are using EPIC. And everything in EPIC is designed to record data so that the hospital can increase their bill. And the administrators deliberately encourage the physicians to fill out as many blocks, and certain blocks are now filled out automatically, so they can maximize their charges. And, that, and if you don't think that's not a deliberate thing to skyrocket the costs, well, you're, I'm sorry, I think that's what it is. So if you guys want to comment on that or you think I'm off my rocker, oh, <laughs> please say so. Well, thanks we for your have, comments. We've got 30 I seconds don't or else I, I'm I, get I, the hook. I don't want to comment about your rocker. That I, I would say that <laughs> the um, the fundamental there, probably the most important thing, is the acquisition of independent practices by hospitals. And I think 340B is actually one of the biggest uh, significant elements in that. So that is certainly something that LUGBA has worked assiduously on and something we will continue to work on. The viability um, of independent practice is certainly something we're committed to. The ability of a solo guy to go out there and hang a shingle, I think we can probably hand ring about that until the end of time, but we're not getting back to that anytime soon. Okay, last 10 seconds, Ron, and we gotta go. One comment about, as a trained resident, just like my friend Tom, um, you know, residents now are not the residents when we train, okay? They don't want to go and practice by themselves. We have solo practitioner jobs. There's a great one in Saranac Lake. None of my residents will go there because they don't want to be by themselves. No residents want to practice alone. Whether they're employed by LUGPA, a hospital, you name it, it's not in their DNA to work and slug it out. They're, maybe they're smarter than us. They don't realize there's more to life than medicine. I don't know. All right, I want to thank Dr. Kapoor for what? joining us. Can I just have one, uh, one brief <laughs> anecdote? I, I promise it's very brief. So to address the issue of the independent practice, uh, I, the first time I met with MedPAC was in 2010. And I met with the chair of MedPAC 2010. And um, I gave him a quote that he told me that I would love to be able to use in public, but, um, uh, but I can't. And I'm not just talking about urology. What I told him is that the solo and small group practice of medicine is like herd animals that have been shot in the head. They're still running because their body doesn't realize that they're already dead. And there is no small, uh, small group and independent and and, and solo practice in any type of specialty that will exist in any meaningful way at all in the future. It's done. The regulatory environment is too complicated. The question is, what is the group that you're going to affiliate with that will have the ability to engage in a meaningful and robust way in legislative and health policy issue to preserve their particular vision of how medicine should be practiced. Sorry, Scott, but I okay. thought that that was important. You got the final word, so thank you, Dr. Kapoor. Thank you, Dr. Holton, Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Albala. And thank you, thank you to, uh, to, to Dave and IPCU folks for allowing us our hour today.